if I've learned anything, uh, is life doesn't always go according to your plans. I planned on going to Ohio State. I planned on being a great football player, and all the greatest things happened to me and my family, and, you know, that didn't go according to my plan. It's been amazing, you know, and there's all obviously also been tragedy. I guess, you know, it happened to us because we were strong enough to go through it. And, uh, Looking, looking at it in hindsight view, I mean, you could call it, you could call it a miracle. The border marker reads, good fences make good neighbors. Given the states this marker divides, maybe it's supposed to be ironic. The celebration is underway in Columbus. Hello, For nearly 200 years, the 70-mile border dividing Ohio and Michigan has been both a figurative and literal battleground. In 1835, on this spot, the two briefly went to war. These days, it's a different battle. One fought each November, the scarlet and gray on one side, the maize and blue on the other. For the communities along the border, the families that live here, the rivalry can bring them together or tear them apart. This is Ohio State, Michigan. Stryker, Ohio, just 10 miles from the border. This is where the Mueller brothers grew up. For Blake, Brock, and Elliot, there was no question where their loyalties fell. Their father, David, was a Buckeye, as was his father, George. Never had a chance to meet my grandpa, George, but I was always told that he used to keep lucky Buckeyes uh, in his pocket all, every day. So uh, that sounds pretty crazy, but uh, that's just kind of the way, way it was for my family. I grew up hating Michigan and never really knew why. I remember during the 90s getting together with my dad's brothers and watching the Michigan game and, and watching Michigan win every year and having them, <laughs> you know, just uh, be about as angry as I've ever seen them. Hats would hit the TV and it was very passionate and decorated everything and always wore the colors, so it was, about as intense as you can get, I would say. That intensity spilled over into the backyard where the brothers learned football from their father. Saturday mornings, he would spray paint a football field. And I mean, he took it real serious. Like, we're playing football today? And he'd go, oh, yes. We'd draw up plays. Elliot was still pretty young when we did that. So he, was, he just rushed my dad the whole time. So he was just trying to tackle him. And we could tell when he was little, he was still pretty big and that he was gonna be a pretty good football player at some point someday. But there was one small problem. In a town of just 1,300, there was no organized football. I go, Dad, how am I gonna play football if we don't have football here at Stryker? He goes, oh, you will. He goes, you can do it, Elliot. You will, you will.
When Elliot was in fourth grade, he finally got his chance. The Mealers moved to nearby Wasion, a town that had midget football. His father signed him up right away. He dressed Elliot for every midget football practice and watched every practice. He always told Elliot the night before, you gotta tell me what you want to eat for dinner. Always steak, potatoes. I had a lot of fun, you know, watching him play midget football just because even then he was bigger than everyone else and usually he was either tight end or fullback and he'd just run all the way up the field with four or five guys on his back. November 7th, 1998. Elliot's parents brought him here, the Horseshoe in Columbus, his first college football game. Ohio State, undefeated and ranked number one in the country, took on the unranked Michigan State Spartans. You are looking live at Ohio Stadium in Columbus, Ohio. The November weather is starting to change, but the Red Hot Buckeyes are a four touchdown favorite over Michigan State. I can remember being real hyped up and my dad, you know, this is the year, Joe Germain at quarterback and Andy Katzenmoyer. And this is the year they're gonna do it. Elliot and his family watched as the Buckeyes jumped to an early 14 point lead. Jermaine hit for the backside fumble, and the Spartans go for it and got it. Michigan State stormed back in the second half, scoring 19 unanswered points. Touchdown! Michigan State ties Ohio State. With just over a minute left, Ohio State trailed by four. The game came down to one play. The Buckeyes' perfect season hung in the balance. And Jermaine takes it deep to his middle, intercepted, and it is over. The number one team falls. And I knew that I loved Ohio State at that time because I remember how bad it hurt. It was the longest car ride home and we were mad and that's where it all started for me. Elliot wanted to play for Ohio State. His older brother Brock paved the way to Columbus, enrolling as an undergrad in 2004. By then, Elliot was a standout offensive lineman at Wasian High School. 6'6 and 300 pounds as a junior, Division I college programs came calling. But it wasn't his beloved Buckeyes that showed the most interest. Mike DeBoard from the University of Michigan was the offensive coordinator, was at my school. The conversation was kind of short, but he wanted to let me know that they were interested. And when I left the office with my uh, the head football coach at Wasion, I, I go, did he sneak a Central or an Eastern Michigan in there? And he goes, that was a Wolverine. A Wolverine, as hard as it was to imagine. In the spring of 2007, Elliot, his father and mother, headed into enemy territory. It was their first time in Ann Arbor. I instantly fell in love with it, and so did my mom. She, even when we left the first visit, said, this is the place for you. And, uh, and me and my dad were a little more hesitant. My dad especially is like, hey, let's not get crazy here. We got other places to see too. He was a little <laughs> disturbed. He would go to bed at night and say, we just have to wait. We just have to think this out, make sure Elliot makes the best decision for himself because Ohio State, they're still going to call because they don't even know who they're missing. Ohio State did not call, and Elliot had to make a decision. But first, he had to tell his father. You know, it was just me and him. He said, don't you think you should wait? Don't you think you should wait? And I go, Dad, I want to go to Michigan, and, and that's, that's that. It was a big deal. I'm like, I could get divorced over this. On the night of April 23, 2007, Elliot Mueller, a lifelong Ohio State fan, verbally committed to Michigan. I actually kind of broke down and cried a little bit. Part of it was joy. And the other part of it was realizing my whole life, my childhood, I'm kind of turning my back on it. 
You're a Wolverine now. Elliot had no way of knowing that his decision would have repercussions far beyond football. It would change the course of his life and the lives of those he loved the most. When you grow up in Northern Ohio, along the Michigan border, and your dad is a lifelong Ohio State fan, it takes a lot of heart to tell him you're gonna play football at Michigan. Elliot Miller had a lot of heart. A lot of it was committed not just to playing for the Wolverines, but to his high school sweetheart, Hollis Reeker. She wanted to make, you know, my life better. And she was always, you know, what's going on? Is football going okay? She was the one person that I could feel free to just tell anything to. And that's just kind of how our relationship grew. They were best friends. I mean, she would tell me that. She goes, I can talk to him about anything. She shared her faith with them. She shared, you know, the sports. She turned blue overnight. December 24th, 2007. Elliot and Hollis, high school seniors, plan to spend Christmas Eve together. They're going to join Elliot's family at a holiday party in a nearby town. Before we went to the party, when we were at our house, she came over to our house, and I got in there these three rings. Each one was a different, you know, kind of gold or whatever it is, and she loved it, and, and she wore them that night. At around 9 p.m., they left the party and headed back home to Wauseon for midnight mass. It was my dad, my brother Brock was in the front seat, and uh, my mom was in the back seat, I was in the back middle, and Hollis was in, on my right in the back seat, and uh, we were just on the highway, and nobody was really talking, and I had my arm around Hollis, and, and she'd actually uh, fallen asleep. At 9.35 p.m., they reached this intersection, six miles from home. Another car, driven by a 90-year-old man, was approaching. It ran through the stop sign. I knew that we were going to get hit. It was almost slow motion. You see the lights and there's not time. It was like two seconds. It basically T-boned our car, and I just remember us spinning around 180 degrees and then feeling the force of the car to start to turn on its side. Next thing you knew, we were sliding on the top of the car. Everybody's hands were on the roof, and the odd thing about it is that I don't remember. I mean, it was like Hollis and my dad just disappeared. I can remember my mom screaming. I can remember Brock screaming. I can remember me screaming, but I don't remember anybody else. The Mealer's SUV had flipped and landed on the side of the road. Elliot and his mother crawled out of the rear window. His brother Brock was trapped. I don't remember how long it was, but you know, I could hear my mom shouting for me. And you know, I remember reaching for the steering wheel to try to pull myself out, but I was stuck. My right arm was uh, you know, lodged in the door handle. So I just said, okay, I'm just gonna try and you know, lift my whole body out and hopefully the arm will come with it. And um, that's when I realized that I wasn't, you know, moving my lower body at all. My mom, you know, told me to come over and help her push open this window, we gotta get Brock out. And I looked in there and I just seen Brock, you know, and he, he, uh, he was just laying there trapped in the front seat. And Brock had a cut on his nose and was bleeding and uh, he was just in the worst pain, just screaming and yelling. I just begged Elliot to get him out, you know, and Elliot worked on the car for quite a bit, and um, we couldn't get a door open, and um, I remember seeing Elliot take the window, just pulling it right out of the socket, and removing it from the car, and I was so happy. 
that he was that strong. And then the next thing I knew, he pulled his... He was trying to get the car moved, and um, he ripped his shoulder, and then it was all over. Elliot could no longer help his brother. He also couldn't find his girlfriend, Hollis. When we walked around the car, you know, I seen her little camera case, and her purse was a little further down the road, and she was laying under the car. She was kind of like in a ditch a little bit, so the car wasn't necessarily on her, but it was over her. And I, I checked her pulse. I was, I was holding her. I was talking to her. I was just telling her everything was going to be okay. And uh, I was just talking to whatever was on my mind. So it, it's hard to be able to sit there with her and, you know, hold her hand and not be able to do anything. Moments later, an emergency crew arrived. One of the paramedics had jumped on top of the car. He asked me if the person was breathing next to me and, um, but my, I guess my, uh, my dad had fallen, um, you know, from the driver's seat down to like, the passenger side, and I had never, you know, even known he was there. I put my left hand on his back on his jacket and just, uh, you know, tried to uh, yell for him. I, I just, I don't know, I just kept, kept yelling for him. I just never got any response. Emergency workers pulled Brock and his father from the wreckage. Elliot called his girlfriend's parents. Hollis's little sister Maddie was who answered. And you know, I was I was basically screaming and crying and I had a million things running through my head and I told her just to put her mom on the phone. So I took the phone and this person is telling me that I need to come to the, there's been an accident. And I'm like, who is this? And he's like, it's Elliot. And uh, so I knew it was bad. So I went to hang up and I quick said, how's Hollis? And I didn't hear any response. And um, so I hung up the phone and we left right away. They had Elliot on a stretcher. And that was the first thing I seen when I got there. And uh, they were kind of working on him a little bit. And um, I just, you know, they had him in a neck, uh, neck brace. And, uh, and he was just really crying, really hard. And I just sensed something different in him that, I mean, I knew that he knew something, um, you know, that was really bad. He, <laughs> he never could look me in the eye. <clears throat> Never could look me in the eye because I think he knew, you know, at that time, <clears throat> what, what what had happened. In the early hours of Christmas. Elliot's girlfriend, Hollis Reeker, was pronounced dead at the scene. She was 17. Elliot's father, David Mueller, was also killed. He was 50. Once I was told in the ER, I just remember basically screaming. And I just remember closing my eyes and I was just crying and the hardest I've ever cried, and I just, I just couldn't believe it. Doctors also told Elliot his football future was in jeopardy. He had torn the rotator cuff in his right shoulder. Elliot's brother, Brock, was rushed into surgery. He had crushed two vertebrae. 
After eight and a half hours, doctors stabilized his spine. But they told Brock he was paralyzed below the waist. I just remember like shouting out to God. I was just like, oh my God, don't let this be, you know, my future. Brock Mueller was told he had a 1% chance of ever walking again, but he wouldn't face those odds alone. Help would come from the last place this Buckeye ever imagined. Christmas 2007. Elliot Miller is in an emergency room in Wauseon, Ohio, his hometown. A car accident hours earlier had left him with a torn rotator cuff, an injury that threatened his football career. His brother Brock was left paralyzed and given only a 1% chance of ever walking again. His father, David, and his girlfriend, Hollis Reeker died in the crash. I just couldn't believe altogether that this could happen to me, let alone, you know, I'm losing my, my, my two best friends, my dad and my girlfriend. I think a lot of it was just denial. I wasn't willing to accept it. In the days following the accident, Elliot's denial turned to guilt. The really hard thing for me to to grasp is the fact that I had my arm around her and uh, she was sleeping on my shoulder. As small as she was, she, one of the things she always used to tell me and she always used to just love is when I would hold her. And, you know, here's the, you know, big opportunity and I just felt like I could have held her. I could have kept her in and I didn't. And that's, I don't know just feels like it was in my hands. And it's just something I ask myself all the time, you know, why, you're the big, strong boyfriend. Why couldn't you have held her in? For weeks, Elliot's mother was at the hospital with Brock as he recovered from spinal surgery. Elliot was left to grieve alone. When I would go to my house, it just wasn't the same for me. My, my room wasn't the same. Uh, you know, without my dad there, without my mom wasn't there, uh, you know, it was just hard for me. And I needed somebody that would listen to me, somebody that I could go to. And I ended up going, calling up the Reekers and asking Hope, you know, can I come over and just hang out with you guys? I couldn't wait to see him because he was the last one with her. And I just, I needed to know everything. He came out and he sat on the couch and he just told us the whole thing. And uh, I just needed to be with him because he was the last one with her, holding her. They offered me just, you know, if I wanted to stay the night there with him, I could. And I ended up staying one night, you know, and then a couple nights. And then, you know, it ended up turning into a big thing. They ended up just taking care of me and that's where I felt comfortable. Going through something like this just breaks down a lot of barriers and I just fell in love with him even, even more. And it, how do you explain that? I don't know. You know, it was just like, wow, he felt a part of me and um, felt like my own flesh and blood. It was healing. Elliot was also healing, emotionally and physically. In January 2008, Weeks after the accident, he had surgery on his torn rotator cuff. Elliot faced months of rehabilitation to have any chance of playing football at Michigan. I told Elliot and his mother this, even with the accident, if you can't ever play again because of the shoulder, you're still gonna have a scholarship to the University of Michigan. So you don't have to worry about that part of it. And I assured him then that we're there for him every step of the way. And anything and everything we could do for Elliot, for Shelly, for Brock, the entire family, we're gonna be there. Elliot's brother Brock faced a more dire situation. He needed intensive care at a top spinal cord facility. 
there are only a handful in the country. They said, look, we can take them out to Colorado, we can take them you know, to Florida, or we can take them to Ann Arbor. These are your choices. And right away we were like, wow, Michigan's an option? And they said, yeah, Michigan's one of the best places he can be. All right, you ready? Yes. In January 2008, Brock Mueller, still enrolled at Ohio State, was transported to the University of Michigan Medical Center. Michigan had opened its doors to two brothers, lifelong Ohio State fans. Elliot, hoping to play football. Brock, just hoping to walk. Both, hoping to put the nightmare of the accident behind them. I don't know how many times a day, but it's definitely every day I think about it. Every day I think about my dad. Every day I think about Hollis. You know, every day I think about Brock. I think about Brock when I'm going through workouts, when I'm trying to lift weights, and then I realize Brock, you know, he's probably outworking me. I almost always think about Elliot and, you know, I mean, in a way, you know, I, you know, I hurt for him more than, um, you know, myself, because I've obviously felt a lot of physical pain, but the physical pain, you know, there's times that you can, you know, get rid of it, but, uh, you know, the emotional pain, like, seems like it's uh, always scarring your heart. Christmas Eve 2008, one year after the accident. Brock and Elliot Miller are back home in Wauseon, Ohio, with family and friends. We're gonna get things started, so um, first thing we're gonna do, I guess, is you see all the balloons we have, and some of you have markers and stuff, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, we got these. Um, everybody gets one balloon, and you get to write uh, Just write a message to either Hollis or Dee or both of them. And what we want to do is at 9.35, we want to go outside and as a group, release them all. And um, it's just something we want to do. Writing is really healing. And so we just want to do that tonight. I think about dad and Hollis, what was dad's dream for me? You know, his dream was for me to play college football and, uh, you know, I can't let that slip. And Hollis, uh, even though she's, she's up in heaven, she's watching down, I, I still try to impress her. Four months later, spring football in Ann Arbor. Elliot, a red shirt freshman, is with his Wolverine teammates. He had started practicing, hoping to be ready for the fall. He's come a long way, and he's still got a ways to go. You know, we're not going to put him out there uh, just to put him out there. And he's got to earn that, and he knows that. But to me, I got a special thing in my heart for Elliot Miller because of what he went through, because of what his family's gone through, and because of the way he's handled everything. September 5th, 2009. The Michigan Wolverines are opening their season at the big house. Elliot's mother, his brothers, and his girlfriend's family are all there. I know that God and David Hollis are gonna have their arms wrapped around him all day, and if he gets a chance to play, 
I know he will be amazing. Almost two years since the accident, Elliot is healthy and in uniform. Around his neck, one of the rings he gave Hollis that Christmas Eve, and a cross she was going to give him, but never got the chance. On his jersey, the number 57. My dad, he was born in 1957, and I want to wear it to be able to honor him. While I have it on, I'll realize you know, Dad's out there with me. The 83rd season of football at Michigan Stadium begins in moments. Stay by the line, throws complete to the sideline, to the goal line. Touchdown. Look at that speed. See ya. Michigan wants to throw. Wide open touchdown. Michigan is up by 24 in the fourth quarter. Number 57 enters the game. Elliot Miller makes his debut as a Wolverine. Can you believe that's your little baby brother out there? <laughs> he looks gigantic. You got to take your hats off to the guys in blue. Good feel, big guy. That's good. 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 I just want to stand up and yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. Are you excited? Oh my gosh. I was. Uh, on the edge of my seat and just never been so excited. Yeah. My next goal is to run out of that tunnel with him. But doctors still believe there was only a 1% chance of that happening. A 1% chance that Brock Mueller would ever walk again. It would take a miracle. It's one of the most iconic traditions in sports. At every home game since 1962, the Michigan Wolverines have taken the field like this. Here come the Wolverines. In the 2009 home opener, Elliot Miller joined the tradition for the very first time. His brother Brock, paralyzed below the waist in a car accident, was there to cheer him on. I was just on the edge of my seat and just <laughs> never been so excited. Brock Mueller was fighting to walk again, but doctors gave him a 1% chance of that happening. He needed a miracle. I'm gonna try and get ready for this next football season and be, you know, completely rid of my chair by that time. A graduate student at Ohio State, Brock was crossing enemy lines twice a week to rehab at the University of Michigan Medical Center, one of the top spinal cord facilities in the country. Whatever muscles I have working are just, you know, going all out to try and do what I want them to do, so. But in October 2009, Brock got a call from his insurance company. He had reached his limit for rehab sessions. That's when one of Elliott's coaches on the football team stepped in. He was making some gains, but he really was starting to struggle a little bit with the fact that, hey, I'm still in this damn chair. And I started busting his chops a little bit about, you know, when you gonna come in and let us work with you? I can just tell he doesn't uh, settle for anything, and he you know, believes he can do anything. I got more aggressive, and I said, you want to walk, or you want to sit in the chair for the rest of your life? You tell me. You know, and he got a big smile, and he said, I, I got you. So uh, he said, when do you want to start? Up. Better. I was better, wasn't it? Yeah. Brock started that week. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. You fall, you're going, you know that. I'm not catching you. They treat him just as rough as they treat us. They push him. Get up, let's go. They always make him do extra reps. They tell him 10 and he does 20. Drop it up. Up, up. Oh. Hey, ah. Nope, doesn't count, doesn't count. That'll be perfect, let's go. Just those small steps making him do extra makes him in his own mind say, I can walk, you know, I can really do this. Uh, I love ruining your day. Just, you know, to be a part of something that's great, I don't know, it gives you there just you that much more inspiration, you know, to do what you're doing. And I think the whole atmosphere has helped me push through all the hard stages. I can see his determination. 
Now, if there's only a 1% chance he'll walk, I think he may be that 1%. Good on the heels, on the heels. I think, well, let's give him some kind of goal. In April 2010, Coach Rodriguez called Brock into his office. He said, Brock, like, how would you feel about setting the goal of leading the team out for the opener this fall against UConn? I was, uh, I mean, just grateful for, you know, what an opportunity. I think it was about 200 days to go till the game, and I thought that's, you know, a great goal to set over, you know, over the course of 200 days. We had a clock up there that tells you how many days until kickoff, and he would count them down. He knew, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. I'm going to lead these guys out of time. I'm going to stand on my own two feet. Okay. I can't imagine what it's going to you know, feel like when I have uh, the biggest crowd in the nation you know, cheering all around me, and I'm trying to walk at the same time. <laughs> and my, my worst fear is my arms not being able to keep up with my legs or vice versa. He's going to lead us out of the tunnel, sure. He's going to be a person who excels. He's going to walk. He's going to do all those things. The thing that's amazing is not the fact that he gets to lead us out of the tunnel or he gets to walk. The thing that's amazing is he's going to heal a family in that moment. OK. See ya. Love you guys. September 4th, 2010. record crowd of 113,000 is in the big house to kick off the season. We got the man. Thank you. Good to see you guys. We'll be cheering. Thank you. Oh. Hey, good luck today. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Don't worry about it. everybody here loves you. Love you, man. September 4th, 2010, the big house. In front of a record crowd of 113,000, Brock Mueller defied the odds. It had been almost three years since a car accident left him paralyzed. 
his mother Shelly, his older brother Blake, and his younger brother Elliot, a sophomore offensive lineman for the Wolverines, were by his side. It was pretty emotional, but at the same time, I realized that I was trying to get ready for a game, so I tried to control my emotions as much as I could. You know, it's hard for me to even talk about Brock or to even look at the guy without getting emotional just because I, I see how much he's got on his shoulders and how much he, you know, has to tackle every day. Just a surreal moment, but, but the real victory to me was, you know, not just walking, but just being able to share that with my family. When it was the loudest and had the most action going on and cameras were rolling and everything, it was like everything was okay. You know, I just had that, uh, I don't know, that, that moment of peace. Four weeks later, Brock met Haley Frank, who had grown up near his hometown, Wauseon, Ohio. I never got a sense of her taking pity for me. She really understood that I didn't, uh, I don't know, need to be coddled or treated, you know, like I needed to be pushed. The biggest thing was just learning how to help him. And sometimes if he didn't need help, then that was, even that was fine. It's just adjusting to all the things that no one really thinks about unless they need to think about him. To me, it's not really sacrifice, it's just love. As for Elliot, he hadn't dated since the car accident on Christmas Eve 2007. That night, he had lost both his father, David, and his high school sweetheart, Hollis Reeker. Having lost pretty much my two best friends and the two people I was the closest to in my life, I think the fear of knowing that that could happen again, so it makes it difficult to open up to somebody and love again, I guess. That changed in the summer of 2010. Elliot met Casey Kelly, a student at Michigan. I could tell something was missing, that he wasn't really experiencing all he could experience. And uh, I'm a very lively, energetic, outgoing person. And I knew that I could bring that out for him. In the years since the accident, Elliot had stayed close with Hollis's family. He told them he had met someone. We knew that day was gonna come, and we definitely wanted him to, to move forward and you know, not stay stuck in the mud, and we just want the best for him. When he's happy, we're happy. We're having a good time, aren't we? Yes. Yes, we are. My hope was that whoever he chose, that they would accept us as a part of his life. I've been to Wauseon, where he's from, and I've had the opportunity to meet the Reekers and be around the Reekers a lot. I've also been taken down the road. We didn't stop, though. Just to be able to have someone care about not just you, but your story and the people around you, it's a very rare situation, I think, for couples to go through. Elliot was finally able to heal and focus more on football. His junior season, he helped Michigan to a Sugar Bowl championship. The following year, as a senior, Elliot was named the Wolverines' starting center. Right there, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. Come on. Brock continued to work out with Michigan football strength and conditioning coach, Mike Barwis. Oh, oh, oh. He took the next step in his relationship with Haley and proposed to be able to actually reach the goal of, of finding the love of my life and getting married was something that, you know, always concerned me, and especially after the accident, just thinking that um, that, that might be something that I don't get to do. The goal then changed quickly. It was to get Brock so he could walk down the aisle by himself and he could stand up there and embrace his wife the way he wanted to. Come on, Brock, get up out of here, get up out of here. <laughs> 
And he's like, you're not going to want to have a cane or anything. You're just going to want to do it. And I said, yeah, I mean, you're right. 15 months to go until the wedding. Brock ramped up his workouts. He's like, I'm going to be really sore tomorrow. And the next day he said, he's like, oh, I can't even move. And then the day after that, he goes, I don't even know if I can get out of bed. December 22nd, 2012, Brock's wedding day. Almost five years to the day since the Christmas Eve car crash left him paralyzed. I was in the back with him, actually, in a back room, and it was, was kind of like a pregame for me. It was kind of funny. You know, I was stretching him out and warming him up and making sure his, you know, his body was ready to do what he was about to do. I thought a lot about how much my dad had been there for me and just how much he wanted me to find well, that person for me. Somewhere up there, he, he knows that, that I'm happy, and I found that person finally. Brock, you may kiss your bride. It's my pleasure to announce to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Brock and Haley Miller. <laughs> it was amazing to see him step into the next journey of his life. It was almost like a end to a movie. It's been said, the spirit of man can endure only so much. And when it is broken, only a miracle can mend it. So be it. And you're alone in the dark. Football is what I do. It's not what defines me. It's not who I am. I shine a light to lead you. So keep me close in your heart. And always remember the meaning of devotion. It's more than an emotion and you can't count on me and I will stand beside you and I will always try to rob you up. 